This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. So as, as all of our listeners know, blockchain technology has gone through its various phases, right? We started off with payments and then came the whole uh, permission blockchain wave. And now many companies are trying to build, uh, use blockchain technology and its variants in order to improve how processes work inside enterprises. Today, we are going to talk to Stratum, which has a very unique approach to enable sort of uh, trusted workflows or workflows across enterprises. And we are going to be talking about their technology and how they intend to build a business model around their unique approach. But before we start, let's introduce the guests. We have Richard Caetano, who is the CEO of Stratum and Anush Das Gupta, who is the head of research there. So guys, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having us. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. So before we start, let's we always ask our guests about their background story of how they ended up in the blockchain industry. So Richard, tell us a bit about your background and what led you to this industry and this technology. Yeah, so I started in, uh, I come from California and started <clears throat> um, in California working about 10 years uh, for the for the enterprise, um, mostly, mostly working in like government accounting and uh, manufacturing, process automation, high tech security, those kinds of things. And then after that, uh, I started working between San Francisco and New York with startups, uh, digital music and mobile phones and things like that. And then uh, after the financial crisis of 2008, um, I was really interested in, in how that became a systemic issue and problem. And later, of course, when uh, I discovered uh, the Bitcoin white paper in early 2011, uh, I kind of had this revelation and then um, ended up closing out all of my work at the time and kind of just dedicating my life uh, to this uh, technology and uh, spent a lot of time looking at how this could be applied to the enterprise, basically where I come from. And uh, I ended up working for a, a Bitcoin... Uh, exchange in in Paris, France, called uh, Paymium, and worked for them between like 2012 and 13, um, building products and helping them design products. And then um, and then after that, I left Paymium and started looking at how how we can apply this technology to processes and things like that. Going back to my roots, and so I was looking at the blockchain and smart contracts and those kinds of things, and looking at how to build systems on top of the blockchain. So looking at the blockchain as being like a sub layer to other types of applications that could be deployed in the enterprise, stuff like that. And then uh, 2015, I started, ha I had enough prototypes of these ideas put together and um, uh, joined with a few other friends. Um, uh, one, Stéphane Flocon, who was at Paymium at the time, at Paymium at the time, and then Sebastian Couture, and uh, also François Dorian, who came from uh, Sciences Po in the VC world. So with this group of uh, four, we took these prototypes to, to the VCs and we raised some funds around two th around uh, October of 2015. And a week later, after we started uh, the fundraising process, the I think it was the Economist or something like that posted the uh, the front cover with the uh, the trust machine. And so that that I, I would I would def define that moment as like the blockchain moment, right? When we switch from the idea of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to blockchain. And uh, so yeah, we we ended up closing our first round of 600k with the French VC OTM. And started 2016 uh, with a bit of money, and we brought the system into like a private beta, and we started building apps on top. And Anuj uh, Dasgupta was our, our first uh, first employee who who came on and started uh, um, helping us define this technology, and and he was actually the 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 author of the white paper for proof of process. So I'll let Anuj um, introduce himself. Yeah, hi uh, everybody. So. I'm from India and I moved, I started in India, then I moved to New York like 15 years ago and I was working uh, in fintech and working in fintech, you get used to certain kinds of uh, challenges, you know, the challenges which later, I think it was 2011 or 12, just six months after Richard found out about the white paper, I found out about the white paper, so I'm six months behind him on that. So I, when I discovered it, I was like, 
wow, like, you know, I mean, as with everybody, when you first time you know, encounter the paper, it, you can't believe, you know, like how it solves some of the things which you think are impossible to do. So, and then I was still working there and still trying to, you know, figure out what to do with this thing that I like. And uh, and slowly I started moving more towards it, uh, like reading about it, trying to do you know, little this and that. And then finally, uh, a year two, a year, two years ago, I moved to Paris from New York. And uh, there in Paris, as Richard said, I met them and... Uh, and then the rest is history, you know. So I started working with them and the synergy was really just perfect because with my experience in the finance world, I realized there was a lot of recurrent problems that we were having that uh, Richard was already tackling from the perspective of enterprises and supply chains, you know, with his experience. So from my experience in FinTech and experience of enterprises and workflows, we realized that we have something together when we finally wrote the paper and, and we developed the toolkit for working with the processes and workflows. So, yeah. And what's, so what's the, the, the core vision of Stratum? What are you guys trying to accomplish? Okay, so, so Stratum is, is primarily a, a software security company and, and our efforts are focused on securing processes or workflows uh, between stakeholders, between different enterprises, between uh, companies and regulators, you know, between partners and customers. So basically, whenever you have different people working together on a deal, um, you know, there is some type of process. And, and we actually have this uh, fundamental uh, perspective of that the world it's, is entirely created from processes. Everything from the business world to the natural world, even to your like identity, these are all various forms of processes. And so naturally we thought, well, you know, uh, in a hyper-connected world, a lot of our systemic issues are coming from the inability to work together on these processes. So if we can apply a, a, a modern te technology stack to these processes, and if we are able to secure them in a way that where we can exchange uh, proofs of these processes, then then we can like enable a kind of a, a, a paradigm shift in information technology. And so, uh, just just to talk about this a, a few more minutes, the if you look at if you look at the the uh, prevailing information technology paradigm, it really comes from the way of how we secured information in the past, which primarily is okay. So you have some you have some information on a paper card, you put this in a box somewhere, you organize it, and then you lock it up in some room, right? And so the first problematic issue we have is that you have a single key holder. Whoever controls the, the key, who has, who has the key, is the one who controls the, the data information in that uh, room. So this is this kind of pyramid approach to securing information. Now secondly, when you have multiple pyramids of information or black boxes working together, then you have this kind of trust issue like, okay, so my business partner has a room of information and I have a room of information and we've got to work together somehow. and I really can't trust what he has in his room, so I need to kind of work through intermediaries and auditors and regulators and stuff so that we can work together. So the second problematic issue is the synchronization of this information. And then the third is, is okay, so now I have customers, and customers have to give me a lot of their private information that I have to secure. And, and um, while this may be okay if you know, you're working uh, with a small set of information, but in today's world, uh, as we're more hyper-connected, you know, customers are... Um, required to give up more and more personal information, right? So this issue of, of privacy, you know, confidential information. So when you put those three together, this, kind of, this, this is kind of how we see the prevailing, the prevailing um, information technology paradigm. And what we saw was, okay, so now if we, switch the, if we switch the paradigm of how we're securing information, you know, what, what do we have available that, that can be the catalyst to that? And so if you look at uh, the first one, well, a single key holder is the old paradigm, and in blockchains, you know, you have many key holders, and so now you've got a you've got a network of key holders. And while you may be able to compromise one of those keys, it's really impossible to compromise the entire network. Okay, so that's the first shift, right? And then so now you have, if you look at the synchronization issue of synchronizing data and being able to trust your partner, now if you look at the blockchain world, we have this idea of okay, we can solve double spending, and which is a very difficult problem. So now we're we're able to not only uh, break apart the single key holder, but now we're also able to synchronize how we come together on information from a protocol approach, right? And then the third one, which is kind of uh, more of a philosoph philosophical approach that we have in how we construct systems, is that we share proofs of data 
onto blockchains and not data. So data can be remaining, they can be kept confidential, encrypted, they can even be kept by our customers. But as long as we're able to create some kind of cryptographic proof to represent that data, um, and if that, if that proof um, convinces a verifier beyond a reasonable doubt, then now we can exchange those proofs rather than the prime information. So we see those three things coming together as, as, as the paradigm shift. And, um, and then do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically one of the pioneering aspect is that when you talk about security, it's always from the perspective of uh, securing something from external attacks. So you do it with firewalls, you do it with access control systems where you make sure only the authorized people can get in and, and you have certain rights to do what you have to do. But at the same time, people who have already authority to be in the system and people who are part of the system, you cannot guarantee the honesty of the system. Now, that's the other question that we want to ask is the question of trust is asked only in the question of honesty. It's not the question of securing from external attacks. It's the question of securing from internally. So when you ask the question of security, then, for example, in the case of uh, Google, it is secure from external attacks. But you cannot be sure, and you know, as it's been proven, that they are not manufacturing the data on the number of YouTube hits that they have. That's another question. That's the question of honesty. So the question of honesty is very different from the question of hacking. So what we realize is just preventing hacking, uh, preventing unlawful usage is not enough. It's part of the picture and that was important for most of uh, information systems. But with the hybrid connectivity of the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's more and more data is being managed by these software systems and more and more data is being given to the software system. So you need to trust the software system. So that's the question of honesty. So our approach is trying to build, uh, trying to include proofs in processes that the processes should be able to be self-evident in their honesty, in their trustability, in their trustworthiness. So, be able to prove the integrity, prove the integrity, of, the integrity the of a process to your, your partner, yeah. So, so you guys outlined some of the problems that you're seeing. When you look at Stratum and think a little bit further ahead, let's say 10 years, what kind of impact do you hope that the company is going to have on, on, on those problems and on the world in general and, and perhaps also in particular sort of on this field of technology that we call blockchain today? I like that question because it highlights this. Okay, so if, I, if, if, if we ask about like what is what is going on in today's world with all of these new technologies and protocols? We see that decentralization is changing the nature of the enterprise, and they're changing the way that we engage with the enterprise. And and there's a lot of potential in that transformation. And so it, if we look at if we look at Bitcoin, right, we can see that Bitcoin um, demonstrates how we can replace some some of the core functions in let's say banking and central banking and payment systems and those kinds of things. I'm not saying that it completely replaces those systems, but I said, but I'm saying that it can. It, it can replace some core functionality in those systems, right? And so we kind of developed this, um, uh, this kind of almost um, looking forward, we kind of say, well, if, if we can take these systems and if we can keep on wrapping decentralization forward, how much, can, how much of the enterprise can we replace with decentralization, right? And so like Ethereum and things like that are really trying to, trying to break into that, that question. Um, however, I would ask the question, Okay, let's say you can dissolve the enterprise in decentralization. What what is left? What is really the what are some of the things that did, that companies that enterprises can do really really well? And for me, I see that as service. Like a company, companies compete on who provides the best service. As far as I can see, decentralization doesn't really provide service, right? Companies provide service. And so the question I would look at, I, I would look at the question as what are the qualities and characteristics of decentralization? that we can bring back into the enterprise that allows the enterprise to provide better service, allow the enterprise to compete on being a better service to their customers. And, and the two things, uh, and this is highlighted in the proof of process white paper from Anuj, is um, if, if we can provide transparency and traceability, those two qualities alone can significantly improve the amount of trust between uh, customers, partners, regulators, and the enterprise. 
And by, by, by bringing those into the enterprise, the, the enterprise can provide a better service to the customers, right? And so those are two important things that, that we want to work with, with um, going forward. Now, if you ask the question, where is Stratum going to take this in 10 years? Um, we really believe that, that by improving trust and improving service, we create a whole new game for the marketplace, right? Customers can now, or excuse me, the enterprise can now compete at a new level and take it to another game. And we want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of, of that conversation, that direction. We want to be thought leaders in that, that space. And we want to help these enterprises get to a new level of service. So, for example, trust could be sold as a premium service. Like the other day, I was flying from mm. uh, New York to Paris. And my flight was delayed for four hours because they had a problem with the wheel of the plane. And we were all scared because it's a plane. You don't want anything. I mean, you don't want to hear a flat tire of a plane, right? And then after f four hours, we had to get out of the plane and we got back in and no one knew none of the passengers what was happening. The airport authorities did not know what was happening. The subcontractors who were working on the plane had their own systems, their own processes to check the wheel. And they were doing that while we were waiting. And the airport authorities were completely in the dark. And of course, we were in the dark. So I realized, wait a minute, like airport authorities have their own processes and they have processes because it's working. So I'm sure they have everything figured out. But their processes are so out of touch with the processes of the subcontractor and the customer is completely out of the loop of everything. So if the airport authority and the subcontractor have a way of communicating between each other, a proof where the, where the subcontractor could publish a proof that, yes, I did this and this check in the uh, wheel, this is left. So then the airport authority can honestly report what's the status of the wheel. And all the customers will be like, I knew I would be willing to pay five, ten dollars, fifteen dollars more if I get like on my app for the flight company, I'm gonna name the flight company like a check, like crypto cryptographic proof with like a barcode or something where I can scan and it says these are the 19 checks before you fly or 200 checks and this much has been done. And you know you can trust them because it has been secured by a system which cannot be tampered or manipulated or changed. So trust, this is one example. It could be many other examples like that. Trust would be as systems are getting more and more interrupt, interdependent on each other. Trust would be one of the most premium service that businesses can leverage, especially if you are providing some basic service. So, uh, I was I was going to the Stratum white paper. It's it's a it's a it's a very interesting white paper. It's called Proof of Process. So our listeners might want to read it. And the and the idea was that like whenever whenever a process is done inside an enterprise or let's say with a customer with an enterprise, you have some kind of audit trail by which you can prove to some other stakeholder outside that interaction that certain things happened. And you know, like I, I kind of connected it to my life, and uh, I, I, I could see some value in it. So, so for example, I, right now I'm going to move to the United States, and in the United States, one of the hardest challenges that like immigrants face is that the banking system of the United States does not want to extend credit to immigrants because they don't have a credit history in the United States. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I moved there. I've, I've moved to the United States, right? I'm just let's say two months into the United States. I need to buy a car. The banking system of the United States is not going to give me $30,000 to buy a car because I've never taken a loan in the American banking system before. And uh, they don't know whether I'm trustworthy enough to repay it. But I do have like a credit history back home in, in Switzerland, back in India. And what I thought was like I've taken some loans back in India and that is a process I've undergone with the bank, right? I went to the bank one day I gave mm -hmm. them some documents. They gave me some money. I, uh, I I returned that money once, like every month for a for a certain defined amount of time. This is a process, right? And if I could have a proof that I have done these lending transactions or processes with various different banks across India, and I could furnish all of these proofs to the American banks, then you know they might just trust me more and be willing to extend me credit, even if I don't have a credit history in the United States. So the ability to take processes you have done in one nation and 
proof that you have undergone this these processes in another nation might just be useful for somebody like me who keeps changing nations like every few years so this is the kind of imagination i had is that is that is that right like is that is that the notion behind proof of process or yeah so so accurate i mean because just what you explained was every nation is a silo to another nation like it's a black box right goes back and to that pyramid pyramid yeah pyramid, because no nation wants to trust and and maybe it worked yeah. at one time right but now we're that, hyperconnected yeah, we, but now we demand hyper-connected. this kind not of not just data but yeah. humans are hyperconnected yeah. you know like i live in paris before that i lived in america and and before that i lived in india and i know your pains you know i and later i can tell you ways to get loans in america it's very like this you know <laughs> uh, because you would not no, i'm telling you like it was difficult for me to buy a car and, and depends on where you live so so if the process that you did in india could be cryptographically secured in a way that there can be no doubt that it has been tampered and then you can tokenize that entire process using mathematics so you can aggregate all of the pro- steps of the process and you get a final token now if that token is presented to the bank the bank could use the mathematical algorithm to validate all the steps without having to trust you or even the indian bank for example and then what happens it can use that token as a reference to issue a loan to you so when the loan is issued the entire lifetime of the loan it could be 3 years for example in that lifetime of the loan the bank has its own computerized system it could be a centralized system by the way the bank the american bank but in the transaction that the american bank has say in oracle database it has so it will literally be a column with your name and your account number and all that and there will be another column saying reference or something like that which would be just a like a hash wouldn't mean anything but with the proper algorithm you could put the hash and it could recreate the steps and it would say okay so any time if someone wants to have an audit report of what you did like for compliance reporting and all that you can do that so that that's yeah, that that would be interesting could be yeah that goes back to just one thing i mentioned earlier on um, that process that identity is a type of process right uh, your identity chain the things that uh, that you can prove that you have done and these little nuggets of information especially if they're like cryptographic and they represent some kind of signature from another institution another trusted institution these little nuggets can become very valuable especially if you have a nice string of them so it's like a it's like a hat with a bunch of feathers you know my hat's kind of worth something and so and so when when we're looking at this at stratum we we're we're designing systems uh, proof systems uh, which um uh, which are a fundamental pattern in how we're designing the system. And these proof systems, um, you would apply a taxonomy or a classification system to them, right? And so, like, if you're in one country and this type of proof is classified as, you know, uh, a repayment of a loan, uh, a payment to my cell phone bill, or some kind of a utility bill, right? If I, can, if I can prove 36 payments have been made, this is, this is credit, Right. If I can prove this, and every payment was made back to BNP Paribas or Société Générale, whatever, oh, I'm sure this could mean something significant to Citibank in the U.S. Right. And this can be independently verified. It doesn't have to go back to some other black box system. Right. So now, if I can walk around with a USB key, with an identity chain, with all these cryptographic proofs, I should be able to walk into a bank and have them verify my creditworthiness instantly. Right. And this goes back to the question of how do we see the world in 10 years? Uh-huh. This is what, what I want yeah. to see, that Meher gets to move to America and, and just, <laughs> it, it's just smooth. Like, you don't, there's no process of, you know, issuing a new identity to Meher in America. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can port your identity from India to Switzerland. To, it should be one continuous chain. Yeah. We want to get through this hyper-connected barrier in a new way and not be relying on the old paradigm. The old information technology paradigm. We love to see this transformed into something much more fluid, much more human, much more. Eh, I can carry this around. Like I don't need and to. Of course, there are more layers on top of it. I mean, oh yeah, of course, I don't want to yeah. get more detail, but as so far, but we can talk later. Which is simple thing is if you have a set of data which has been signed by multiple people on multiple occasions, it is difficult to lie on that. It's common so you can lie on a single piece mm-hmm. of data, not on 20, 30, 50, You know, like in block Bitcoin. 
on a single block it I mean, it's okay but when you have six confirmations i mean you couldn't have lied because it's so much so it's same thing here and on top of that if you have multiple trust sources uh say if you have a network incentive incentive form of network reputation network where you have you are doing certain activities like loans and finance things and you're getting points based on if you default or not and if you're paying on time and all those things and they do that with credit rating they do that all the time with all human beings we have that right now if you have multiple institutions signing on you and rating you based on your credit if there is an institution which is fraudulent and does not do all the background checks you will see that that institution has signed off on a lot of sets of data that other all the rest that say there are 10 institutions trust sources like one of the trust sources is completely out of sync with the out of sync with the rest of the nine institutions so what happens automatically you can figure out which trust institution is at fault so it's also not just trust in the citizen or the customer which is you but also trust of all the banks and the so trust sources which are involved in this because if they are not on sync on the same set of data that means someone is at fault so we call this trust resilience so you can form resilience mm. on trust sources yeah, with proof of process so just an overview to, to get into it more and but you can... asked a question what's it like in 10 years yeah it's a big <laughs> it's a big vision Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J -A -X .io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. So, okay, so let's let's drill down into like proof of process and how you're yeah. going to build these systems, right? So I think there's, there's two, two aspects to this. I think three aspects to it. One is like, what is a proof of process? Then how do you build it? Then how it gets applied, right? So before we start, let's have kind of a rigorous definition of what a process is in the first place. So can you, can you guys tell us when you say process, what do you mean? Because like one of the interesting things that I see about Stratum is like every every blockchain company that comes around um, has has a different way of attacking enterprise uh, business. So if you, if you look at R3 CV, they'll say the fundamental thing is an agreement, right? It's an agreement between two finance companies and they are out to build this system that makes it easy bit for financial companies to make agreements with each other. It's Stratum, it's like, you say that the fundamental interaction between companies, between customers and companies is a process. And then you are building a system that makes these processes that you have done in one place provable to some other person in another place. So what, what is a process fundamentally? Okay, so um, I'd like to circle back on the process question, but let's go back to our fundamental thing. What is the fundamental thing in Stratum's approach and vision? And that is a proof system. And so when we say we're a software security company, we, we work with blockchains, cryptography, and proof systems. Um, the introduction of a proof system is appropriate here. So a proof system is a very simple pattern that identifies two actors. So you have a prover and a verifier. And the prover's job is to convince the verifier of a secret or fact within a reasonable doubt. And the way that the prover and verifier can do this is by, by creating some type of protocol between the two and exchanging messages until the verifier is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so that's our fundamental, that's our fundamental thing, is a proof system. So now, if we ask, okay, so what is a process? And then how do we apply... As an example, like yeah. Bitcoin... Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Example. As a, in a Bitcoin blockchain, you 
it's a proof system because you have to prove when you send funds that you own the funds, uh-huh. right? Using a digital signature. Or when you discover the knowns and you declare it to the network and the network is the verifier that, and you are the prover. If you can prove to the network that you have indeed solved the puzzle, you get the reward. So as Richard said, the fundamental paradigm is ultimately if we can uh, break down every process into these two sides, a prover, very fair. Like when you are paying in a central assist like PayPal, you are providing your credit card. So you have to prove the, so PayPal is the very fair, you are the prover. So this is the fundamental paradigm. And Yeah, so now... Yeah, so coming back to what is a process, a process is a sequence of steps. In time. Yeah, in time. And each step, uh, we, we say there are five elements to each step. There is a who, what, when, where, and why. So who, who's involved? Who are the participants in that step? Um, what is the data being represented or what is the action like or what is the, the substance of that step? Uh, when did this step happen in time? Uh, when, or excuse me, where did this step happen? So if you have steps A, B, C, and D, we need to make sure that D comes after C and not the other way around. And in our case, there's a why. So why is this step important in a greater context? Okay, so it could be a type of like legality or terms and condition or some kind of contractual agreement, these kinds of things. So that is a why. Okay, and there's some unique things to 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 to, to observe is in 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 a process or in multiple processes, especially in multiple processes. Um, you can have one process one process split into two processes, so there's a fork. You can have two processes or three processes be joined to create one process. You can have multiple processes synchronize. So if I have steps, different steps, at some point we need to synchronize the the steps. Or perhaps you can have different processes come together in a way that that fulfills some kind of contractual agreement, right? So that's 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 how we that's how we define a process in 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 our in proof of process. So for example, the example that you took is when you go to the bank and you submit your documents. So this is a step when you're at a bank and you submit the documents. So in this step of submitting documents, the document would be the what. Uh, the who will be your signatures, like you are involved in this. The when is the timestamp, you know. The where is, the, which is the beginning, so it's the first step in this case. It could be the second step, 19th step or whatever. And if there are forks, then it could be in the seventh fork, ninth step, like, you know, like a graph. And the why is the actual legal clause, which says somewhere, say in India, that for having a bank account, you have to provide a proof of address, which I'm providing, that is given by the utility company, electricity company of some government certified electricity company. So if tomorrow the regulation changes, which is the why, the same step becomes invalid. Because you might have the same the data, everything is intact. But the regulation says today you need a signature from a landlord, not utility bill. So then you have to have a new step. So if any of the data of the five uh, modalities of every step changes, then the step becomes invalid. Then you have to furnish a new step. Now, when you provide a step, so you provide the first step, you provide some documentation where you live. The second step, you provide some documentation about your birth certificate for you. And the third step, you provide some documentation about your salary receipt uh, salary like pay stub from your company. Now, with each of these steps, you can have forks where trust sources, which could be banks, the government authority could be, they could add their step saying, we sign, we have did the background check on this document, we see the document is all correct, and we give certain score, for example. Could be multiple such forks coming out, each, each fork for each institution that signs and that puts its own score. So what happens, you realize in a graph, you can have a data format where you can have series of steps done by a certain user to uh, uh, as part of a process. And there could be other stakeholders 
who are part of the process but have their own forks and they add their own attestation, their own data, their own whatever they have to do. And based on that, at, the, at a certain moment, you can aggregate that data and you can create a kind of a token. On the other hand, if you have a step where, for example, you, like in a supply, supply chain, uh, the wheel of the plane, for example, there are some companies making the spoke, another company is making the hub, for example. So each company has their own process and they converge at a certain process. So when they converge, then you need both the uh, stakeholders to sign on that step. But as an individual, you need separate stakeholders to sign on the, each of their forks. So this is the general overview of how processes to get more into it are, are modeled in, in proof of process. Today's magic word is process. That's P-R-O-C-E-S-S. -S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So you guys both came out of the, or, or were at least familiar with, and, and kind of came out of the, the Bitcoin um, ecosystem. And a lot of people are looking today at Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum and uh, different variations of those technologies and, and, and new ones too, to, to solve some of those problems you guys are talking about. But proof of process doesn't have a blockchain at its core. Why not? And what did you guys find lacking in, in some of the other approaches? Well, that's, a, that's a good question. So, um, so if you look at what we are, so if you look at what most of the companies are doing with blockchain today, um, they're mostly working with assets and the movement issuance and the transfer of assets, these kinds of things. And, and, and I know there's different uh, ways to, to do this on a blockchain. You have the, the unspent transaction outputs, or you may have color coins, meta coins, those kinds of things, or more traditional type of ledgers like rows and columns. But fundamentally, it's the movement of an asset and who owns that asset, right? And so when we look at, when we were doing this work back in like 2014 and 15, we're looking at, okay, so if we want to model processes, um, really the nature of the data structure is, is more graph-like. And so we wanted to come up with something more, more flexible um, and, and not so, uh, I, I, to be careful, this not so rows and column-like. And, uh, and actually to illustrate kind of the idea more, like if you, if I were to illustrate this as, as a kind of a metaphor, it'd be like, uh, let's say I had QuickBooks and I want to model a business process onto QuickBooks, right? Each step of a process. It's kind of not the right really problem solution fit. And so we were like, okay, so if, if, if this is what we're trying to do, model graphs, um, then what good is the blockchain? What, what does this bring? What kind of value does the blockchain bring to this, to this um, uh, data structure? And so if we strip down the blockchain, down to its fundamental of like, what does it primarily bring? And if you go back to Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, like the very first thing uh, that he really addresses is that it's a distributed, uh, decentralized timestamp server, right? And so we, in proof of process, we look at a blockchain as uh, the ability to, to have multiple stakeholders come together on a common timeline. Once we have a common timeline, then we can publish proofs of different steps on that timeline. And so that's really the, the when, right? So you have the who, what, when, where, and why. So the when is what the, the blockchain provides. And of course, there's other things that it provides as far as like consensus around the proofs and those kinds of things. But primarily, that's the, the main thing. And, uh, and so when we look at it that way, it kind of simplifies everything. And so we're going back to the proof system uh, question. What, is it, what does it convince a verifier of, right? If I'm proving something to a verifier, why do I need a blockchain? What does it bring? Well, I can prove to a verifier within the, the, the consensus model uh, that something that I published something on a certain date time, right? And so I, I want to kind of circle back on something really funny here. So if we say that if we say that a public blockchain like Bitcoin gives us some kind of time stamping ability, and the time stamping comes from the miners in a network. And um, if we ask, well, where does the mi where do the, each miner get their time stamping ability from? Like, well, how do they know what time it is? Um, you can actually see that a lot of the miners pull their time stamp from some kind of public 
uh, time server. <laughs> so really, like it kind of gets convoluted on what we mean by time, right? And so when we're looking at a consensus model, all we really want to do is we want everyone to agree that that there's a certain amount of time, there's a time frame where everyone can can kind of pin some kind of timestamp to, all right? So the, the fundamental layer of the blockchain that we use in this case is for two things. One is we utilize the blockchain as a consensus timeline. So by consensus timeline, I mean when you have processes and when you have multiple stakeholders involved in the processes, the supply chain example I gave you, each of the subcontractor have their own processes, their own set of ev events. But when you have to have multiple parties, their own processes work together, you have to order those events. So the way to order events is using some sort of a central uh, clock. So instead of a central clock, what we do is we have everyone pick their own clock and through a consensus, they get to select what step should be next. So that's why the blockchain here provides a timeline that is objective and common for all the stakeholders, but a timeline, objective timeline that is not based on a trust source, but based on consensus. The next thing is what it does is every piece of every step in the proof of process is only valid if the step could be provable. If a step has a data that cannot be provable, then it is no point in putting it in the proof of process. So when you when we put anything on the blockchain or when we provide the steps for the blockchain to align it to its objective timeline, the thing that we are looking for is now that we have a timeline that we all agree, can we also have proofs that we all agree? So we all agree to the right version of truth. Because just putting data on a blockchain doesn't make sense in our perspective. What we believe is only that which is provable should go to a blockchain. Now, from this perspective, I just want to quickly mention that the idea that with the traditional blockchain that we have is that you uh, from before through code and logic decide what are the outcomes that would be a b or c which is a smart contract or even see the mining uh, that you have that you you decide that if you find the nodes you have this 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 you get to open five or so you provide a proof of what could happen if so and so can be verified right so this is the kind of proof system and we call this a proactive proof system because it's a proof system that is forward facing. That is a proof system that you define what are the conditions for the proof even before the actual event yeah, happens. And given you have clean logic, repeatability, these kinds of things, determinism, you can say that we can arrive at this outcome through the execution of code. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's proactive proof. Proactive. So it has to be deterministic the, or repeatable. And you cannot have private confidential information because confidential information if you want to put it out there, others will be able to see. So in certain cases, yes, but in most cases, you cannot have it, right? So this is one limitation that we already see. That, so the another kind of proof that is possible is when processes are flexible, like some of the processes we mentioned already, and when processes have confidential information, what you want to provide is not the information for others to verify, but just the proof of the information. So for example, instead of approving the actual data for a KYC, you provide enough proof that it could be calculated that all the very all the signatures, for example, you could just do signatures from trust sources have been attested or not on the data sets. And the signatures could be, you know, independently and could be openly validated without, you know, the actual private keys, right? So this kind of proof, which happens after something has happened, so it's backward facing, we call it retroactive proofs. So it is proofs as the example that Mayer gave about the crypto audit trail is it's a proof when something has happened. So, so you have proactive proofs and you have retroactive proofs. Now with these two, there's another aspect of proofs are connected to proofs of facts, because if you can prove a set of data, then the data could be called a fact. Fact is something that represents reality, right? So to prove anything, the fact has to be fact checkable. By that, what I mean is if you provide like in the Bitcoin blockchain, the fact of a certain uh, money that I'm sending to Richard, it's objectively verifiable. You could do fact checking 
using mathematics that the fund that I have actually the fund that I have or what goes in a transaction comes out of a transaction. I'm not making up new money in the transaction. So you have these kinds of facts which could be objectively verified. And you also have facts which could not be objectively verified like a document where I live. Or it what has, is the weather? What is the what weather? Is a, you know, it has to be a trust source. Yeah. So these are subjective <laughs> facts. So you have... You can have proactive proofs. Because you need some kind of observer to attest for that. It is for that, exactly. Yep. So you have proactive yep. proofs on subjective facts and proactive proofs on objective facts. And you have retroactive proofs on objective facts and retroactive proofs on subjective facts. Now, if you want, I can give examples of all the four, but yeah. it's more detailed. So. Let's actually take an example. I, I'll try to walk through an example and, and maybe we could connect to the DL uh, distributed yeah. ledger technology question from there. So a few episodes back... Um, Leanne came from Everledger was on the show, huh. and she uh, she came came up with the idea that what the blockchains will allow is for us to have uh, this notion of KYO or know your object. What ah, she yeah. was saying is, um, like let's say there's a diamond, right? So she's she's, she's thinking of, of diamonds, but it's it's val it's valid for fish, it's valid for shrimp, it's valid for wine, etc. So you have some object like a diamond. And ultimately, you as a consumer, many times you want to know where it came from. So for a diamond, you want to know that it's not a blood diamond. For, for some wine, you want Italian wine, you want to know that it actually comes from, let's say, some, some winery in Florence, right, near Florence. Or uh, for a Louis Vuitton bag, you want to know that it actually comes from the factory of Louis Vuitton, right? So, so in, in, in all of these cases, what you need is a proof that yep. this object changed hands in a certain order. So, for example, for a diamond, I want to know my, that my diamond changed hands from De Beers to this, you know, big exchange in Brussels, from, from this big exchange in Brussels to the retailer, and from the retailer to me. So I want, I want to know, I want to have a proof that all of these exchanges happened in the past. So as in Anuja's language, I want a retroactive proof, retroactive that, proof yeah. that these exchanges of this object happened across these parties, right? So in this scenario, like walk us through like how you would build a proof of exchange of these diamonds across these parties in the stratum method and then like contrast it to doing the same thing as many other people are trying to do is use blockchains mm -hmm. like whole blockchains to build the same chain of proofs what's the difference yeah so so i like to start going back to the proof system who's the prover here's who's the verifier and then how do we construct a proof to 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 to, to convince the verifier of whatever we're trying to convince, right? So if I am the seller and I'm trying to sell to you the diamond, what do I want to convince you of, All right? You want to know that the diamond is, uh, well, it wasn't stolen, it, it comes from a certain region, that it, it was, it, you know, um, that the exchange of the diamond was, uh, you know, with, with in good faith, in good, uh, good yeah. faith, yeah. You want, to know, you want to know all of these kinds of things, right? And so, what you really want to say is, okay, so when we're exchanging these messages between each other, I need to convince you of this beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So if I can construct a uh, proof of process, if I can apply proof of process to this protocol, and if I can construct a series of proofs that can give you enough evidence that you can trace back to the origin of the diamond, right? And then for each step of that process, be able to bring in the trusted sources in, involved, so the subjective retroactive proofs, because in this case, uh, there could be some uh, objective retroactive proofs, such as the quality, or the, the, the quality, the for example, 40Ks or whatever it is. Yeah. Of the, uh, like all the like diamond measurements, I don't exactly yeah. know, like, you know, which I'm, you can weigh and you can say if it is what it is supposed yeah. to be, and the, I don't, those yeah. kinds of things, which are... Yeah. Calculable. Calculable, yeah. yeah. Objective. Yeah. Objective. Objective, yeah, like, like mathematically yeah, validatable. Yeah. Yeah. So then if I can construct a proof of process uh, set of messages that are all cryptographically linked to each pre previous step and be able to provide that to you, it doesn't really need, it have to be on it. It could be 
Uh, it could be back, the, the time sequence could be backed up by some kind of public blockchain, say Bitcoin or Ethereum or maybe some consortium that I would, that you would trust, right? You would, to be part, to be convinced, you need to be convinced of the blockchain. You may not be convinced if I created some kind of private blockchain with, uh, you know, with my own uh, set of validators that no one has access to. That wouldn't convince you. But if I use the Bitcoin blockchain, I'm, I'm, maybe you would be more convinced, right? So you can see as I start constructing the proof of process exchange, the more ways I can um, provide these kinds of facts in a certain way that are provable to you and that you can verify, the more you can be convinced that this diamond is in fact a legitimate diamond. And then finally, for to allow for payments, if you want to have, say, Ethereum smart contracts, you can have the Ethereum smart contracts that accept proofs that a certain things have been done, which the proofs are provided in a retroactive way. And you can, in the smart contract, you can say these are the parameters of the proof you check, some mathematical, some trust sources, and things like that. So what happens the Ethereum smart contracts, while it is public and transparent, everybody can see, you and it can people can see that a proof has been presented for a certain thing without knowing all the details of the proof because those are hidden in the retroactive proof. Yeah. I want to emphasize... So, and that becomes yeah. a proactive proof that the smart contract itself is a proactive, a proactive proof, proof. Yeah. which mm -hmm. can leverage some uh, objective uh, facts and some objective facts. So you have all these four kinds of facts in this case. So in this case, like, let's say, let's say Richard is the retailer and I'm, I'm trying to buy a diamond from Richard. Mm -hmm. So what, what Richard supplies me in addition to the diamond is this chain of proofs that say, okay, that let's say has three steps, right? There's a chain of like a three-step chain. And then on, on each of these steps, it shows me like, uh, let's say one of these steps represent the sale from say D beers to a diamond exchange. Then that proof has essentially a signature from DBS, a signature from the receiving exchange, mm -hmm. a timestamp, mm -hmm. and like what? and like this 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 data was uploaded to Bitcoin, so that gives us a timestamp. Yep, timestamp. So, so it has the parties, their signatures, the who of the transaction, yep. the Bitcoin timestamp, the when of the transaction. Yep. So the why might be you know like. Uh, there might be the law that says that this is a, a legal the diamond. The international law international for diamond, law, diamond, how to uh, treat movement diamonds and, and things all like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So the why. And the what is the is the data of the diamond itself. Like exactly. the, the diamond was this, this particular size, this particular characteristics, etc. And I think that th those were the four things, right? Yeah, it's the five. Uh, five. Oh, and uh, the where. Where. So which step is of the, the first process? first step or the third yeah. step? And, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to say, you don't want to say like, oh, okay, so the diamond came from this area, but then it was, but then someone purchased it before that, it was before the source. Like, then, then that wouldn't make sense. Like, that would be invalid, right? An invalid sequence that would make sense. And that's why what we do in every step, like in blockchain, we include the previous step, the hash of it. Like, so you cannot, you know, like. You cannot force proofs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So in essence, like when I get this proof from you, from Richard, who is the retailer, what I can see is, Provided I assume so that so when I get this proof, I I see all of these public keys that have signed statements. So I need to link these public keys to identities. So some public key might belong to DBS, and I need to link it to DBS the company. But then let's assume that that linkage also exists, and then and then I say, okay, I trust DBS not to sign the wrong things. I trust this exchange not to sign the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And I trust this retailer not to sign the wrong things. But provided I trust these three points, what I have is an objective proof, like not an object, like, like a proof that something happened in the past. In the past. Exactly. Yes. And exactly. the final check, you could write it even before all the events happened. You said, I need signatures of these three. And I need a certain calculation of the weight and all to be this, 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 and this kind of shape or whatever so this is a proactive proof then like in a proactive proof you can check retroactive proofs like in a proactive proof is is basically a code where you say that okay now that you got the signatures you got this 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 and all other things you can even before actually you get it you can say that if these three things are i get it then i will issue certain money or I will unlock the funds and it could be a smart contract. 
So smart contract being a proactive proof. Okay, okay, understood. understood. And essentially what like Stratum is building is like a tool set that allows mm -hmm. all people and organizations of this world to construct these proofs exactly. and, and link them to each other in a, in a chain, just like, yeah, just like Bitcoin, like kind of links blocks in a chain. You're yep. like kind of linking all of these proofs in a chain yep. in exactly. a way that these proofs cannot be forged. Exactly. And, we're, and where we, where we're focusing our work on today, our work today is on helping businesses to prove their internal business operations to their customers, partners, and regulators. So let's say I'm, uh, you can say that I am, uh, 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 an example would be something like, let's say, let's say I'm a stock exchange or I'm some kind of bank or I'm some kind of insurance company. You manufacture you know, airplanes. Or I manufacture airplanes or whatever it may be. And I have internal processes that I need to comply with for the regulators. And I need to show my customers that I'm doing the math correctly. And I need to show my business partners that, um, that the information I'm, I'm providing them is trustworthy like it's it's good you know it's good data it's not uh or for example actually in the recent news uh facebook uh had some uh controversy around um uh they were miscalculating ad impressions and things like that even right? google did that on youtube and google as well stuff, yeah. yeah and so like so how does a company behind a firewall be honest be honest to the public outside of the firewall that their internal business operations are are legit, that are correct, that are exactly. countable, intact, these kinds of things. So by what we can do is we can map each one of the internal operations, each revolution around that as a step in proof of process. We construct proofs to represent the data, the who, what, when, where, and why of each of those steps. And then we can publish those proofs to a type of like public uh, audit trail, or excuse me, audit hub, okay? And then outside of the firewall, the business partners, uh, customers, regulators can access those proofs. And so that when we give, then the, when the business provides them with a service or a product or whatever, they can verify the integrity of all of the data that went into creating that widget or whatever it may be, the service, right? And so by doing this, um, this is a, I love quoting, quoting this from Manoj's uh, uh, work. Um, if you can replay the steps of a process, you get traceability. If you can prove the data behind each step of that process, you get transparency. And you put those two together, you have conditions for improved trust, for improving trust, right? And so, and so that's where we're applying proof of process technology right now, is uh, to basically capital markets, to insurance, manufacturing, and energy. And personally, you know, with uh, this one with, uh, with IoT, uh, it's, we have data that is being generated constantly right from our pockets on our wrists or everywhere right now i mean with iot it will be how we need an honest world because now technology is inside our bedrooms you know so i find it that much more relevant in the long run but yeah. so that that gets us to an important point right a lot of the technologies that you guys are using to to accomplish what you're accomplishing is it has been around for a long time right i mean yeah it doesn't actually rely on you know even kind of what bitcoin did with proof of yeah. work yeah. so why why is this the right time like why hasn't this been done before and why do you think today it the time has come for this technology to change how companies and organizations function yeah it's a, i think that's a great question so you have so if you look at when bitcoin came out it was literally right after the financial crisis, <laughs> right? Almost as if it was some kind of like, you know, in, in, you know, in, the, in, in the dark, just kind of lurking, waiting for this primary, you know, time to pop out. And, uh, you know, almost as if it was a response to a big problem, right? And so for us, we think that, um, that as the world is now more hyper-connected and accelerating, you know, as more and more interactions and uh, interdependencies are, you know, are more um, relevant, that proof of process technology is type of, you know, it's, there's a necessity for it. And, and, and we are somehow in that moment in time that are, you know, working with that, uh, that technology in that space. I mean, in, fa in fact, uh, it found us. <laughs> 
you know because we were just moving around in life and we used technology and like the thing of you know me being a someone who moves from countries to countries i experience silos on a daily basis and if you have ever been to a government uh office you know what a silo is uh and you have silos everywhere in life and as with technology everything is getting so uh interdependent without us being able to totally depend on it so uh it was obvious that we saw these kinds of problems coming up and uh, some of the promises that we saw in the bitcoin blockchain and the things that came after was really relevant to us that showed us something could be possible like the the problem of double spending you don't need to solve double spending if it's i don't know 1991 and banks are centralized and people are trained to work on their computers and they do it and you don't have a phone where you can do you know accounting and all that i mean it's just centralized you you don't even have atms everywhere you know i mean it's so centralized so you don't even need it but then you need it yeah. you know and yeah. it was solved by now i think you know, so, and we see this we see this reoccurring in history right we see that nasdaq comes out with new financial trading uh tools and services and technologies around the early 70s i believe it was you know yeah. in a response to more and more traders working together and then we're we're finding that they they found that there was limits to actually doing ticket trading and you know and settling all these trades and so you bring in technology and there's a big shift there you know which is interesting because in then, 1960 something they had the paper trail uh, problem in uh, the in new york stock exchange i believe and as that also where there's so much of paper they like to actually transfer the securities by paper so they actually architected as a draft one of the first proper decentralized network of uh, of accounting and payment that never actually money never actually went public or was implemented because they didn't have technology and if you read uh, you know some of the things of nakamoto paper you see some you see reflections kind of yeah. yeah yeah so it and was, we have ddcc which yeah, is a centralized yeah. server which solved that yeah. but if you want to have the same centralized service as ddcc without a centralized service yeah arpanet as a response to yeah. to to communication resiliency and in the threat of nuclear war these kinds of yeah. things so yeah i think it's recurring so richard in the blockchain space You know, we often see this this massive uh, potential in the long run, right? We see all these changes, but one of the topics that a lot of uh, companies and projects are struggling with is what's the right business model? Like, how do you actually monetize it, and where's the value going to go when you when you affect all these changes? What are your views on that, and what's what's the strategy that you're pursuing today, and that you see yourself doing in the future when it comes to monetizing what you guys are building? Okay, so yeah, so I'm I'm a I'm an old software guy, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm in my 40s now and uh you know, I've been through the early like I've been through the 90s with uh, Microsoft and uh, you know, Oracle and these companies growing and then I saw in the 2000s, you know, the internet models and, and the dot coms and things like that. And then now with decentralization, we're trying to find new business models like that. Um, you know, working with the enterprise, I think it always comes back down to like stability and predictability and um you know m- more you know more solidity in the business deals and so i as stratum we go back to just like you know software uh, license sdks you know yes open source technology there are components that we build that are open source as well um and you know these are based on concrete things like transactions or users or servers installation things like that Um however but when building a business model in today's world too when you're projecting forward you know we're projecting into a dis- like we're you know we're disrupting existing business models right and so when we're looking when we're talking to investors today like okay so where where's our future revenue going to come from um rather than looking at it as tearing apart enterprises and trying to break them down and try to create all these really complicated business models around it it's just like saying well no let's just go back to the principle of saying we're going to help an enterprise um provide better service through trust for the customers and we're going to help them be leaders in their markets right and if we can enable that then we can see our bottom line increase in proportion to that right we want to help strengthen the enterprise and take them into into new into a new vision and so that's that's kind of the that's kind of the approach that we take um trying to not overcomplicate and get too too weird about it 
Yeah, that that is a, a you know refreshingly uh, traditional <laughs> approach. I mean, it is as boring as as you know an enterprise <laughs> needing their processes to be secure. We will go and study their business and understand what kind of steps are involved. We will model that process. We will figure out what kind of you know as we said like. Can there be objective validation? Can there be subjective? Yeah. We figure out that, then we find out which parts could be retroactive, which could be proactive, and then based on these four, like retro, pro, objective, subjective, we build a proof system that yeah. secures all their processes. So, yeah. that, you know, that, yeah. uh, you know need, needless needless to say, I mean, it, we we okay. If if I were to look forward and say, okay, what kind of companies would we somehow step on the toes of, right? And so one obviously would be the old software companies like Microsoft, SAP you know, Oracle, these kinds of big box companies that would see like, okay, if Stratum's vision starts rolling out and gaining tremendous traction in the market, I would assume that they would be looking at it and saying, okay, this is a new space, you know, and we're going to want to be part of it. Okay. Second, I would say that, you know, some of the big four who, who provides auditing services, you know, if we've got a real time audit system and we have proofs behind that, then I would think that companies providing auditing services and things like that, would start to say like, okay, we need to do something in, in response to, to, to this technology, proof of process technology. Uh, and the third would be your intermediaries and trusted sources. Um, you know, intermediaries exist because they handle the trust issues and transparency and traceability issues between enterprises. If we can automate that through proof of process technology, then their business model could be disrupted. However, the trusted sources, such as like, um, like we work with a, uh, some companies in France that provide um, validation, verification of business supply chains and things like that, um, we think proof of process technology can actually improve their business, right? So looking at those three groups of companies and how we might be, you know, kind of working ourselves into this, um, we would, our position would be to say like, okay, we're not really trying to go after and just like destroy these markets. We're just trying to build new technology and how it unfolds could make those three groups, uh, could be working with those three groups of companies, a very interesting uh, experience in the future. Well, Richard and Anoush, thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure uh, talking with you guys and learning about your vision. Now we're going to have, of course, links to their website uh, on the in the show notes. And there's some very nice uh, documentation and uh, PDFs and, and details about what they're building and also diff some of the different use cases that we didn't get to speak to today, like uh, micro insurance, KYC and stuff that, that are on the website available. And also, uh, of course, we'll link to the open source part, which is uh, I think called uh, ChainScript. So that if people want to check that out, they, they can also do so. So yeah, Richard and Anoush, uh, thanks so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. And to listeners, um, thanks so much for listening. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and other shows on uh, letstalkbitcoin.com. And uh, if you like the show, if you liked uh, this episode and uh, episode in general, then please do us a favor and leave us an iTunes review that helps new people uh, find the show and uh, helps us do an even better job. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.